March 21st, 2023. It is uh, almost uh, 1 40 in the afternoon, 12 40 in the afternoon. And the Committee on State, Local Government, and Veterans uh, is called to order. Members, we do have a quorum. Uh, we have a full day and a full week as we head into the second deadline. Uh, today is the day where we will hear a number of the other veterans' proposals. We've heard some already in this committee, but we're hearing a number of other veterans' proposals in this committee today. Uh, I expect that we will work until about a quarter to three, uh, recess, and then come back to finish our work this evening. Um, and I appreciate everybody's uh, uh, really incredible work uh, as we work our way through uh, these uh, important issues today. Um, so with that, I am going to ask uh, uh, Vice Chair Mitchell to assume the gavel, and I'm going to uh, present a couple of bills with, uh, with Department of Management and Budget. Thank you, Senator Murphy. Can, you are um, welcome to go ahead on Senate File 1424, bringing that before us um, at your leisure. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair and members. Senate File 1424 is another of the proposals coming from the administration, this from the Department of Management and Budget. Uh, and I'm here today with uh, uh, Britta Raytan, uh, the Deputy Commissioner. Uh, who can tell you more about this proposal that is before you, which is simple uh, but important. Madam Chair, can they uh, speak a little bit into the microphone, please? Thank you, Senator Anderson. I will lean into the microphone. Um, Go ahead. Thank you, um, Senator Mitchell. Uh, my name is Britta Rayton. I'm Deputy Commissioner at Minnesota Management and Budget. And this uh, bill is proposing to eliminate the reporting requirements, um, which requires every executive branch agency each October to report on all interagency agreements, um, both interagency and intra-agency transfers that have a cumulative value over $100,000. So this report has been uh, sent to the legislature every year. Um, since it was added as a requirement in 2017. Um, it's proven to be a rather onerous task on the fiscal staff within agencies to compile this report. Um, I believe the most recent cumulative total of the report was over 4,000 pages in a, a quite a few staff hours <laughs> across the executive branch in order to compile the report. Um, we certainly don't have any concerns with providing the information, but the information is available in other ways. So um, all legislative um, fiscal staff, nonpartisan House, Senate, and legislative budget office staff have access in, in the system in real time to interagency and intra-agency transfers. Um, and certainly if there's further information needed on any of those transfers, um, the state agencies are happy to provide it. Just compiling it into this comprehensive report has proven time consuming and we have not, um, in, as we've talked to the other state agencies, we have not heard back that there's been a lot of engagement with that report once it's provided. So we think it's a um, time savings to, to not have agencies compiling that every October. Madam Chair, that is the proposal before you. Thank you very much. Do members have any questions? Senator Draskowski. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, thank you, Senator Murphy. Ms. Rattan, how many agency, how many interagency transfer, transfers are recorded each year in this report on average? Um, Senator Draskowski, so each agency submits their own report to the legislature. I do have a spreadsheet that compiled the total. Um, the total in pages, but I don't have the number of transfers. So the total in pages that were sent to the legislature um, in 2019 was 4,143. Um, it took about 500 hours across the executive branch to compile that information. Um, each interagency transfer then includes um, the agreement that goes along with it. So I don't have the actual number of, of transfers that were in the report, but it is um, a lot of information in, 
I'm, I'm sure there's some interaction with specific transfers that have more interest, um, but that can also be pulled through a report out of the accounting system. Thank you. So, Madam Chair. Oh, Senate, oh, okay, Senator Tukaskowski. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Ms. Rutan. Um, well, I, Senator Murphy, I, I find it interesting. I, obviously, a, a bunch of us are going to have problems with this bill because it decreases transparency in government. And obviously, the executive branch wants less transparency um, if they're wanting to get rid of this measure uh, that we do have in law. Uh, 500 hours equates to one-fourth of a person of an FTE. One-fourth. Now, members, if we think about the number of FTE proposals for increased FTEs that have come before us, I'm remembering bills that have dozens. One had 130 FTEs or something like that to increase FTEs in government. And we see the executive branch focused on one quarter of an FTE. That suggests to me, members, the idea here or the motivation may not be from the executive branch one of saving time or saving money because obviously they're engaged in supporting bills that are bringing hundreds of FTEs forward in additional spending. Uh, instead, it's something else. And I'll offer, Madam Chair, um, I hope that something else isn't, and if we can defeat this measure going forward, uh, we can make sure it isn't uh, something around transparency that the, the people of Minnesota know and deserve. Uh, that's what this law provides, and uh, for that, uh, Madam Chair, members, I, I hope we can, um, I can hope we can not do this. Thank you, Madam Chair. Senator Barr. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just a comment that as the legislature got this report, shouldn't we as legislators have started to move, reallocate the money? I mean, if you've got 4,100 pages of money transfers intra-agency or intra-agency, aren't we putting it in the, typically putting it in the wrong silos or pots or whatever, and we should have been reallocating this? I personally think that we should use that report and rework budgets so that the money's going where it's supposed to go and then we'll actually know where it is and we, we, we authorize it to be spent or allocated in a certain fund. We can look at this fund and say, yes, this is growing or whatever. Isn't that what the 4,100 pages really says is that we didn't allocate the money in the right spots and we should have done a better job with that? I mean, shouldn't we keep this report for that reason? Deputy Commissioner. Senator Mitchell, uh, so often what we're, at least I'll speak to MMB's um, interagen or interagency transfers, often what we're doing is providing a centralized service such as our enterprise training and development that MMB provides um, out to state agencies and so, um, or the work of our children's cabinet supporting other agencies. So there is cross-agency work that happens and these interagency transfers are reflective of that. Did you have another one, Senator Barr? Well, it's just, or a follow-up? Yeah, thank you, um, Madam Chair and uh, Representative Murphy. I think that what she's really dealing with, we, we probably didn't ask for the right report in the first place when this was written. So I, I, have, I won't be voting for it, but um, I get where there's a problem, and we should probably have this report actually dialed into what we want, not where we have... Um, like the children's cabinet, where you're providing the administrative part of that, that's not something that we really wanted to know because when we authorize that, the legislation says MMB will provide administrative support. So while it shows up in the report, that's actually the money's allocated correctly. And um, the, what we should be looking for is when you're actually transferring from one agency to another because we have excess funds as opposed to we authorized you to do this in the first place. That shouldn't have been in the report. So maybe we should take a look at that sometime after we hit deadline and see what we're really looking for and see if we can dial this up to tune it up to what we actually want. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair and Senator Barr. Thank you for that. I appreciate it and we should. Okay, uh, Senator Anderson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Senator Murphy, um, what's, the, what's your overall intent of this bill? What's your purpose in bringing this bill forward? Uh, Senator Anderson, I think that uh, I have a couple of intentions with this proposal. I believe that uh, 
it is right for us to take a look at this question that has been brought forward from MMB to make sure that the work that they're doing is actually bringing value to Minnesotans. Um, and I think they're raising that question, and I think we should answer that. And Senator Barr just offered, I think, uh, uh, his own perspective on that, which I really appreciate. Um, I think we're also making sure that we have proposals uh, in the committee that we can use to advance uh, omnibus bills. Well, Mr. Madam Chair, I, I would like to have a roll call on this bill, please. Uh, okay, Senator, this is being laid over for inclusion. This is, this is to be laid over for inclusion. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Senator Lang? I just, thank you, Madam Chair. I just got a quick one. Um, is there any limit to $100,000 transactions that can take place between interagency? Is there a limit to them, or can it be perpetual number of $100,000 transactions? Because the, the bill is pretty short. <laughs> Deputy Commissioner? Um, so, Madam Chair, Senator, um, it's reporting on transfers that cumulatively are over 100,000 between agencies. Um, so the, it, it's within um, some program authorized by law that that transfer would be happening, or if there's work happening across agencies. I, I'm remiss that I didn't mention earlier, a number of these transfers are also, for example, to Minnesota IT Minute, um, where they provide a central function for state agencies. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. I guess the, the next question would be MinLARS. When MinLARS happened and Minute was getting, I was assume, a long list of transactions, uh, is there any limit to the number of $99,000 transfers that they make? I guess that's the question. Deputy Commissioner. Um, Senator, if there was a for, if it was happening for the same purpose and they were underneath that dollar threshold, they would be combined together is my understanding of, of the way it's written. Okay. Madam Chair, I guess, I guess who, de, who decides when it, when it says the purpose, uh, if one was when Minlars was, you know, having advertising issues or when Minlars was having, uh, you know, implementation issues when it came to the, are those two separate things or are they the same thing and who decides that? Deputy Commissioner, uh, Senator, uh, I can't. I, w I was not involved in the, in those transfers. Sure. So but I, my assumption example, would be maybe, if but. if they're for a system and they're between an agency to an, from one agency to another for the same system, those would be added additive. And MMB would make that decision. Madam Chair, sorry. Deputy Commissioner, Senator, no. Each each agency is doing their own reporting. This is not centrally compiled by MMB. It, the, the law is for each agency to provide their report to their uh, legislative committees. Okay. Okay. Seeing no further questions, I move that this be held over for for inclusion. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Next up, Senator Murphy. Oh, no one. No one has to move. Uh, so we have Senate File 1426. This would also be laid over for a possible conclusion. Um, Senator Murphy, can you present your bill? Uh, thank you very much, Madam Chair. Uh, again, uh, an agency bill coming from Management and Budget. Deputy Commissioner Raytan is with me today to talk a little bit more about the proposal. Go ahead, Deputy Commissioner. Please state your name for the record. Thank you, Senator. Again, uh, Britta Rayton, Deputy Commissioner with Minnesota Management and Budget. Um, so this bill addresses the acceptable forms of collateral that can be used to secure state funds by banks, and it would modernize the list of collateral that the state can accept for um, deposits of our state funds. Um, so collateral is uh, protecting the state funds in those banks, and under current law, the state can only accept bonds as collateral from our banking partners. Um, however, under a separate law, local units of government have a wider menu of options available that, to them for accepting collateral. So the proposed language would extend the same menu of options. So essentially, this is aligning the state statute with the statute that exists for local units of government's collateral. Um, in law. Um, and there would still be uh, collateralization of the funds that are held in the bank, um, but there are options for collateraliz collateralizing that uh, funding that are less expensive and less onerous to administer for the banks. 
Um, having more options available to the, our state's uh, banking partners will increase the number of banks that can compete for the state's business. Um, just want to highlight that one of our current banking partners um, highlighted this as a benefit um, to the bank because there is less reconciliation that needs to happen on an ongoing basis if we're using other forms of collateral instead of simply bonds. Thank you for your testimony. Were there any questions, members? Seeing no Ma questions. Madam Chair. Oh, yes. So, Senator. Chair. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Mr. Tan, Mr. Tan um, although I, I tend to agree from the perspective of making sure that we have uh, done it for a little while and the collateralization I, was always an issue, um, but it would seem to me that the executive council is what I have a problem with. So if there was a determined need, um, you know, in, in within an agency, to me, um, I'm worried that there is no limits and no bounds to what the executive council has done. And in this particular case, I, I, I agree with the intent of, of lowering the cost because it's very expensive I, being on that size. And people don't understand not just the collateralize what it is, what's there, but many times a uh, financial institution will have to collateralize at 110, 120, 130 percent of the, uh, of the uh, deposits, which is very expensive, and especially nowadays. Isn't there a better place to, to have an informed decision of our, we've got our board of investment, we've got a variety of other um, resources that manage our financial assets. And, and I would rather have um, somebody that's, that it's their sole purpose in life in their industry than the executive council making that decision. So I guess, Senator Murphy and Ms. Rutan, if there's a better way to do that, that we can get I believe more financially and intelligent decisions from the perspective and remove political motive, um, I would rather, I'd be much more comfortable in being able to support the bill um, with some other, with some parameters that it's just not the executive uh, committee or council. So thank you. Were there any questions or comments? Senator Barr. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, this might be a little redundant here, but you got a copy of the bill in front of you by chance? Thank you. Could you tell me what would it be an example of line 1.18, 1 1.19 um, issues of United States government agencies or instrumentalities as quoted by a recognized industry quotation service available to say? What, can you, somebody give me an example of what that would be? Thank you. Madam Chair and Senator Thank Barb. you. We are calling in backup. <laughs> there you go. All right. At least that's what I perceive. And once you're settled, if you could please state your name and title for the record, please. Thank you, Madam Chair. And for the record, my name is Jennifer Hassamer. I'm Assistant Commissioner at Minnesota Management and Budget. Um, to answer that question, federal securities, there's a large number of federal agencies that issue their own securities. And perhaps one of the best known that folks are most familiar with would be Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac um, to secure various housing mortgages that get repackaged at the federal level. Okay. Yes, Senator Draskowski. Thank you, Madam Chair. Now that we've got phone a friend up here, maybe um, what about the next one, uh, beginning on 1.20 to 1.22, the um, general obligation securities of any other state or any state other than the state and its agencies? Please go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair and Senator. That language is actually just a rewrite, rewrite of what is in current law. Um, as Deputy Commissioner stated before, current collateral options for banks are bonds. Um, this is just a different way of stating that bonds of other states other than the state of Minnesota, as well as, as, well as local units of government, are acceptable forms of collateral. Okay, seeing no further questions, I move that this be held over for possible inclusion. Thank you. And Senator Gustafson will be coming up while I present.
Senator Mitchell, you may begin when you're ready. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, and before I forget, uh, begin, this is our last agency bill before we start working on all the veteran stuff. So, um, so Madam Chair, this is Senate File uh, 2225. I'm asking that this be moved uh, to the judiciary. It relates to data practices, um, some of the provision modifications, and if I can, I would like to turn it over to um, our agency partner for the rest of the testimony. Hello, please state your name for the record and you may begin when you're ready. Thank you, Madam Chair. My name is Julie Byrell. I'm the legislative assistant, or legislative director at the Department of Administration. Used to be a legislative assistant many years ago. Uh, thank you to Senator Mitchell for hearing, or for authoring Senate File 2225, which is Admin's Policy and Technical Bill. You'll see from the various provisions in the bill the breadth of services that admin provides to state agencies and Minnesotans. I'm gonna briefly walk through the bill. I know you have a long agenda today. Section one codifies an existing rule for the data challenge appeals process and clarifies that the commissioner can dismiss appeals that do not meet the minimum requirements. Section two updates admin statutes related to the move of the Office of Collaboration and Dispute Resolution from the Bureau of Mediation Services to admin in 2019. And many of you uh, may be familiar with the good work that OCDR does with the Civility Caucus. Section three of the bill codifies the Office of Enterprise Sustainability, which was created by executive order in 2017 to assist agencies in meeting their sustainability goals and avoid energy costs. Section four updates the electric service fee for electric vehicles to charge on the Capitol complex and moves the section from admin's facilities statutes to our parking statutes. Section five removes an obsolete report that admin completed and is no longer required to do. Section six and seven correct mistakes and clean up the statutes after the legislatively mandated transfer of the State Historic Preservation Office from the Historical Society to admin in 2017. And the Historical Society supports these changes. Section eight ensures that census enumerators are guaranteed the same access to apartment buildings as candidates. And that concludes my testimony. I'm happy to answer any questions. And Madam Chair, I apologize. I should have brought this up right away. We do have an A. We're going to do that. Oh. I rescind my comments. We have a cleanup comment, a cleanup amendment, but it sounds like it would be better to go on judiciary. So we're going to put it as it is. All right. Thank you, Senator Mitchell. Members, any questions? All right. Seeing none, we. Uh, oh, Senator Anderson. Thank you, Madam Chair. So we're creating a new agency within an agency? Is that what we're doing? Madam Chair. Senator Mitchell. Uh, and I'm gonna allow the testifier to answer that. Uh, uh, Madam Chair, Senator Anderson, are you asking about the Office of Enterprise Sustainability? Correct. Senator Anderson. Uh, Madam Chair, that was created by executive order in 2017, and we are asking the legislature to codify that in statute. So it already exists. So, Madam Chair. Senator Anderson. Thank you. Um, so how will this, by codifying into under the Office of Administration, make it better? Go ahead. Madam Chair. Thank you. Um, so it protects this, the longevity of the um, office, no matter who is governor. Um, it's not new for governors to create offices um, by executive order, the Palenti administration created um, the lean office, which we now call the Office of Continuous Improvement at admin. Um, and this is just another uh, office created by executive order um, because the governor can do that um, a little bit more quickly than perhaps uh, the legislature may. And then we are asking for the legislature to affirm that um, work and put that in statute. Madam Chair. Senator Anderson. Uh, is there going to be a report on this uh, creation or this uh, codifying of this enterprise sustainable sustainability back to the legislature? Ms. Mayor. Will there be a report? Madam Chair, uh, the Office of Enterprise Sustainability publishes um, information every year on the um, 
the progress towards the goals, the sustainability goals that the aid, that state agencies make. And so they do report every year on their progress. But it's not necessarily, Madam, Madam Chair, directly to the legislature, correct? Ms. Merrill. Thank you, Madam Chair. We publish it. We send it to the Legislative Resource Library. I would have to check and see if we send that to legislative committees. Be interesting to see that. Thank you. Members, any other questions? All right. Seeing none, Senator May Quaid renews her motion to uh, for 2225 be recommended to pass and re refer to Committee on Judiciary and Public Affairs. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed say nay. All right, the bill passes, thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Senator Mitchell, you are up again with Senate File 1509. You may begin when ready. And your testifiers can come to the table if they would like. So Madam Chair, are we doing 1509 or? 2247. Senator Mitchell, I'm sorry, yes, you're right, 2247. Senate file 2247. You guys are next. Yeah. Now you gotta practice run. Um, and your testifiers we, uh, can come to the table if, if they're ready, thank you. Okay, Madam Chair, I will begin in the meantime. So this is um, 2247. Um, which is the budget establishment for the Department of Military Affairs and Veteran Affairs. Um, just to quickly go over some of the many things that are in here. Um, we have the appropriation. We have subdivision one expands the definition of the term resident veteran for the veteran bonus program, um, which is something some of us are very familiar with. Subdivision so two adds the inherent resolve campaign medals to medals for which people can receive that bonus. Um, subdivision 11 allows for reapplication of the bonus if previously de denied and you now meet some of those criteria. Uh, sections 4, 5, 6 amend the GI Bill program and 4 specifically increases the amount of the post-secondary educational assistance from 3,000 to 6,000 a year, lifetime cap up to 15,000. Um, five and six make conforming changes. Uh, seven and eight um, change the Veterans Homelessness Initiative um, and make the section immediately effective, uh, rolling over some old funds into the new biennium. Um, so those are the major changes. And with me today, I have um, Ben Johnson if, uh, with the Legislative Director with the Minnesota Dep Department of Veterans Affairs, if he could also please testify. Thank you. Mr. Johnson, state your name for the record and begin when you're ready. Uh, Madam Chair, members, if I may, uh, the first section within this bill is actually for the Department of Military Affairs. So I, I would, I'm sorry. I'd be happy to defer to Don Kerr if you would like to go first. <clears throat> sorry, Don. I'll put you on the sorry. Floor. My apologies. Oh, that's okay. Thank you so much. Welcome to the committee. Please state your name for the record. Begin when you're ready. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. My name is Don Kerr. I'm the Executive Director of the Minnesota Department of Military Affairs. And uh, the Adjutant General and I actually did present all of the items that are included in the bill here a couple of weeks ago, though I'd be happy to answer any questions that members may have. All of these programs are really important for the sustainment of readiness in the Minnesota National Guard, and we hope you can support us. Thank you so much. Mr. Johnson, are you ready? <laughs> I am Chair Members Ben Johnson, Legislative Director for the Minnesota Department of Veterans Affairs. I knew I could count on Don to be succinct and to the point. Um, <laughs> I will echo, I was here before the committee a couple of weeks ago and went through all the items. Nothing has changed in the interim. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak on this really important investment in, in veterans in, throughout the state of Minnesota. Uh, the commissioner would like me to identify uh, a really important concept here. Um, I, I will admit that a, uh, an increase of this amount, a total change of $95 million over the, uh, for change items over the 24-25 biennium is significant. Uh, but I want to highlight that there are essentially three buckets worth of uh, increases here. Um, importantly, $34 million is one-time funding over the biennium. So this is not ongoing, uh, uh, ongoing investment. This is one-time funding over the two-year biennium. 
uh, that would go to the post 9-11 service bonus increase to make sure that all service members from the past 20 years are recognized. Uh, but it also goes to uh, this, the goal of ending veterans homelessness in the state of Minnesota. So in this one-time funding bucket, um, there is a significant component that will not, not be carried in the base or the tails going forward. Um, we have a significant increase in uh, need that we have not been able to address in our current operational budgets. Um, so there are increases here for the veterans health care division as well as the veterans programs and services. Um, and that money is ongoing, but it's an investment that we have been delaying in a lot of respects. And as the state has um, asked us to serve more veterans in more ways, um, we have added capacity, but we have not added the, the associated funding. Um, the third bucket of money, as, as we have outlined it basically, uh, is, is new opportunities to serve. So areas where, in talking with legislators, their constituents, talking with, with veterans throughout the state, we have identified new opportunities to really hone in our, um, our efforts to end veteran suicide in the state of Minnesota, uh, areas where we can focus additional resources in ending veterans' homelessness, getting up, upstream and uh, preventing veterans' homelessness. So uh, I will admit that we are, um, I hate to say it, growing government here, but it is targeted in some very specific areas to help veterans and their families throughout the state of Minnesota. Um, I would be happy to stand for any additional questions. Thank you for the time. Thank, Thank you. you, Mr. Johnson. Uh, members, questions? Senator Drzkowski. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you for the bill, Senator Mitchell. Mr. Thanks, Mr. Kerr, Mr. Johnson. Can you tell me, uh, for each of your respective sections of the bill, is this the government governor's uh, proposal? Is this the governor's language and appropriation language in the bill? Mr. Johnson. Uh, Chair, Senator Draskowski, yes, this is. This is all, all of the sections were developed in uh, concert with the governor's officer. Okay, so this is his proposal. Senator Draskowski. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Senator Lang. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I guess I'm going to uh, expound on that question a little bit. Uh, this is the governor's proposal. There's a bunch of bills in here that I'm familiar with, but we haven't heard this year. Uh, we're 11 weeks into the schedule, and this is the last week before final deadline. Um, is this the intent to be the veterans omnibus bill, Senator? Senator Mitchell. Um, Senator Lang, uh, the reason that we're hearing it at this point, and I've said this before, there have been other veterans' bills moving at different points. Um, we're doing a veterans' day today, and of course coordinating it with the hearing that we're having tonight. So that was the goal of this committee, is to kind of have a, a veterans' focus today. Um, so this does overlap some of, the, some of the bills that we have, but there will be other things, it is my impression, that will be included in the omnibus. So this isn't necessarily the final thing, but it includes, I think, a lot of things that are important to us that, that we do want included. Vet, veterans homelessness, increases to the GI Bill. Um, so I, I think it's just one kind of lump package of a lot of our top priorities, and then there will be other things that have passed through. I mean, I still have an atro another bill after this. So it, it, this does not preclude anything else that is been seen before us or will be seen before us. Senator Lang. Thank, thank you, Madam Chair. And I, I guess my point is that on line two, or uh, page two, the line 2.19, 2 holistic health and fitness, is there a bill that goes along with that? I mean, this is something that we've talked about for several years. Um, and I haven't heard anything about it this year. And now it's in the governor's budget. And this is the committee that makes the decisions on that bill if it exists. I'm sorry, could you repeat the line? I apologize, Madam uh, Chair. It's just, just one example, 2.19 H2F. That's something that the Veterans Committee had looked at in detail several times and worked in conjunction with the agencies. I'm just curious if it's, I mean, we haven't heard it in this committee. I'm assuming that most of the members probably don't know what it is. Senator Mitchell, would you like your testifier to answer? Yeah, yes, if they would like to. It would be great know, to have them I know explain. Don knows what it is. If anyone has questions and wants to know what something in here is, um, more than happy to. I mean, obviously, I dropped this a few weeks ago, and I would have been happy to take any questions before today if someone had a question on what a program was. Um, and we can answer those questions now as well. Thank you. Madam Chair, uh, Senator Lang. We did make a conscious decision this year to not introduce individual bills for each of the proponents, both in the House and in the Senate. 
Uh, however, this was actually included in my briefing that I provided, though <laughs> very briefly, uh, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, but the information was included in the slide pack, Senator, and uh, that we believe it has been heard in this committee based on that. Senator Lang. Th thank you, Madam Chair. And I, I agree with you in concept, and I understand the way that the agency is, is functioning now, trying to deal with the fact of not having a Veterans Committee, not having the time allotted to you that you'd have in the past. And again, I wish Senator Murphy was here so I could gripe to her. Uh, not so much Senator Mitchell, but um, I, I think you, you have a, a pretty good bill here for the most part, but nobody in this committee knows what's in it. And now we, here we are two days before deadline, three days before deadline, and we have a bunch of people sitting in the audience with the hats that I like seeing, and I haven't seen them much this year. Senator Lang, I think he just mentioned, though, that this was presented in our slideshows from an earlier session, and I'm not sure if you were in attendance that day, but it, it was presented. It was. It was. Did, well, okay. Ms. Madam Chair, line 4.9 on page 4, the SOAR program. I don't know if you can maybe, without having the help of the agency, you know, this is another one. Do we have a bill for that? Senator Lang, we're not done this, with the bills of the day, so this your question like may be answered. I, I didn't see it on the agenda, Madam Chair. And I have a couple of good bills this afternoon, too. But my, my point, again, and I'm digging my heels in on this one, and I think it's valid. We need a Veterans Committee. Uh, I don't think that uh, anybody in this hearing room would deny that fact. Um, we, well, we have a huge bill here that I think I probably support 100% of it. In fact, looking at it, but I, I have no idea because we haven't heard of these bills. <laughs> Here I sit. Uh, I'm going to vote for it again, I guess. But uh, I'm looking forward to the omnibus bill. Uh, I'm looking forward to that. So with that, I've, I'll keep my comments to myself. Well, Senator Lang, we always like to hear your comments, and we are looking forward to hearing your bills. So we will move forward unless there are any other questions. All right. Seeing uh, Oh, sorry. Senator Anderson. I'm going to have to get up really high. Yeah. Regarding what Senator Lang just mentioned about the homeless veterans and the SOAR program, what is the criteria in, in setting up this? It says, Commissioner may use the money for personnel, for training, for research, for marketing. Uh, what percentage of that money is going to be used for administration? Senator Mitchell. That's or testifier. That is... Mr. Johnson. That, that is me. Uh, Chair, uh, Senator Anderson, uh, the breakdown for the uh, SOAR, which is the Casework Outreach Referral and Education Program, is uh, we're looking at 525 per year. 150,000 per year is gap funding, so that is funding that we are currently funding out of the State Soldiers Assistance Program, which is sort of the, the tranche of funding that the agency has had for a century, basically. So this is dedicated funding for that. To make, to make up the difference between the cost to operate the SOAR program and the current uh, need. Uh, 85000 per year is MDVA staff funding. So that is, that is managing contracts, that is interacting with our partners and stakeholders in the homeless veterans community. Um, and I'll note that 85000 per year is less than one FTE. Uh, so it is, it, it is funding some, some of that staff work that you're asking about, but it is not hiring a new person to do that job. It is to fund the position that we are currently funding and having to tap into other resources. And then about 290000 per year is to fund increased demand. So this is, again, preventing the need to utilize that gap funding in the State Soldiers Assistance Program and have, have dedicated funding for the Service Corps Program. So, Madam Chair. Senator Anderson. Uh, Mr. Johnson, um, regarding that, do you know what the percentage is of a admin costs for the overall program that's being provided here? Mr. Johnson. Percentage of 5%, 10%? Uh, no, no. I don't do public math. You, you know I don't do public math. I don't know the number off the top of my head, but I can do, do, you, I, I can we, do back you, of the napkin, sir, if you'd like, but I would, I would rather get it right. So I can follow up and get you that an answer to that question. Senator Anderson, would you be okay if he answered your question offline? Well, it's after the fact, but if he, but if he doesn't have the math available in front of him now, would you be okay if he answered your question later? I guess we have no choice, huh? Unless you've got a better choice. I'm not going to be doing public math today either. But you're not going to do public math no, today. No, okay. I okay. not. But thank you for offering. I appreciate right. that. No. Senator Mitt, oh, any other questions? Senator Draskowski. 
Thank you, Madam Chair. I just just kind of on the same thread, um, Senator Mitchell, are we going to see more details of these programs, kind of fleshing out the details of them? Or are we simply going to turn these dollars over to the executive branch and and assume they'll do good things like everybody uh, understands? Or are we actually going to put it in law in terms of how these programs are supposed to work? Senator Mitchell. Um, Senator Draskowski, so some of these actually will compile some of what we're hearing today. Um, the things that are in here that are not are the specific numbers that the organizations have. So again, um, I, I would have loved if during the presentation we had, if people would have asked some of these questions or, or before when I dropped the bill that people would have asked some of these questions. Um, but the agencies can provide the specifics as Mr. Johnson just did when there was a specific about the program. So if they need to get you um, those slides again or sheets on the programs, we can absolutely do that. Well, Madam Chair. Senator Traskowski. Thank you, Madam Chair. Senator Mitchell, I, I'm not suggesting we hear from the executive branch about what they aim to do with it. I'm, we're talking about what we're going to put in law here. Are we going to have the details of how this is to be spent as we direct the executive branch on how to spend the people's money? Are we going to do that here, or are we just going to turn the money over to them and say, executive branch, go do good things because... We trust you, because that's what I'm reading here right now. Senator Mitchell. Uh, Madam Chair, I would, I would reiterate that we had a presentation on this, but um, Mr. Johnson, do you have more details than what I've already explained? Uh, thank you. Uh, Mr. Johnson. Chair Justice and uh, Senator Draskowski, most of these programs already exist. They, they either exist in session law and are defined in session law on, on how they are funded and what the appropriations are or they exist in statute. And so they've already been de defined by the legislature, sir. And uh, we, we would be happy to continue to brief on any specific questions, but these are programs that have been successful in helping veterans and their families get the assistance that they need. We're not creating out of whole cloth much of anything in this bill. There is new funding. There's identifying established funding, uh, but these all fall within uh, statutory authority or within a pr prior session law or hopefully within this session's law, sir. Best, best uh, answer I've had all day, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Sir. Madam Chair. Senator Anderson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, on page six, it talks about the uh, veterans' health care. And I, I think we're going to be talking about veterans' homes maybe this e evening or this afternoon. Uh, it also mentions here that uh, a veteran community health navigator in community-based hospitals. Um, Mr. Johnson, can you give us a little bit more detail uh, regarding that uh, 6.28, 6.29. When you're ready, Mr. Johnson. Uh, yes, uh, Chair Gustafson, uh, Senator. Um, the Veterans Community Health Program establishes an opportunity to have uh, providers uh, staffing uh, private hospitals, essentially. We would have um, social workers that are uh, that have experience in veterans uh, affairs, uh, working with families who come in who are not in the VA healthcare system, and we would be we would have individuals in the communities helping families navigate either to secure existing VA benefits that they may already have, or uh, li lining them up with options that are not VA based. Um, so really, this is a, a two part goal. One is to continue to get upstream, try and find that. The, the switches to get people mental health or chemical dependency assistance to try and avoid suicide. So this is part of the suicide prevention package. But it also is an opportunity to do some outreach in the communities with regards to um, long-term care or care in the community, care at home, um, so caregiver support for people who are aging in place, uh, keeping them out of um, facilities. So the goal here is to establish uh, that veteran and family outreach program. Um, and it is a, a new area where we would be partnering with uh, gr groups who already are existing in this space, including um, the Elizabeth Dole Foundation, for example, uh, the VA, uh, the existing VA healthcare system, trying to uh, fill some of the gaps in terms of getting people in the community access to the benefits that they've earned. Madam Chair. Senator Anderson. Uh, Mr. Johnson, could you give me a, a, an example of veteran community health navigators, who they are? Or could, or, 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 do we already have that established? Mr. Johnson. 
Uh, Chair Gustafson, and Senator, they, they exist in the VA system, the federal VA healthcare system. Essentially, they're clinical social workers. Um, but but as a, as an agency employee, this is a new this is a new opportunity to serve. It's not something that we currently have. So, so Mr. Madam Chair, so this is actually kind of a new area that's being expanded from the federal uh, on a state level. Mr. Johnson. Uh, Chair, uh, Senator, yes, the goal is to establish a new, that new collaboration, again, identifying the gaps in service. So, Madam Chair? Yes, Senator Anderson. From your experience uh, with the federal government, who are some community-based hospitals that are using this navigator system right now? Mr. Johnson. Chair Gustafson, Senator, thank you for the question. Uh, currently, the example that we, that we were, are relying on or modeling after is Regions Hospital. They have a community, uh, community veterans health navigator employed who does this kind of work, does intake, um, works with the intake teams at Regions, and then helps to triage and identify opportunities to connect those individuals with, uh, with services. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, seeing no further questions, this bill will be laid over for possible inclusion in the omnibus bill. And we are now up to Senate file 1509 with Senator Mitchell. You may begin when you're ready. And we would ask that the testifiers come to the table so we're prepared for your testimony. Senator Mitchell, just begin whenever you're ready. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so I'm here to today to present Senate File 1509 and um, ask for it to be possibly included or laid over for possible inclusion. Um, this is relate related to the Veterans Resilience Project. It's a statewide nonprofit um, that offers evidence-based therapy to Minnesota veterans and service members struggling with trauma, sexual trauma, PTSD. Um, and basically we want to be able to, with some of those issues, um, not only continue the funding for the program that's been very successful, but also because there is a framework for getting people to these programs and helping them meet them up with providers to be able to um, use some of that framework for spouses as well, because sometimes if there's PTSD in the household, that might be something the spouse um, also would need to deal with. Um, so with more on that, I would like to please go to my testifiers. Thank, Thank you. you. Oh, welcome to the committee. Uh, please state your name for the record and begin when you're ready. Thank you, Madam Chair. My name is Eric Wickheiser, and I am uh, with Veteran Resilience Project. I'm actually the board chair and I'm a Vietnam era veteran, submarines, and a nuclear submarines, very proud of that. Uh, what I want to just spend just a minute here talking about our board because uh, the board is the actual guiding force of our uh, organization and uh, they were the ones that drive the bus and we have on the board EMDR therapist, we have a number of veterans uh, such as myself, experienced insurance experts managers and experienced in business and government. And we're very dedicated, we're passionate, very, very active. And I'm mentioning this because I think we're a unique organization to a lot of other nonprofits. With your generous funding, we have a very competent staff and, and operational systems in place to ensure that our mission is carried out and that all funds are accounted for and are for wisely spent. Very important for me and for us veterans. My pleasure today is to introduce Major John Phillips, our therapy director. Uh, Major Phillips, when you're ready, state your name for the record and begin. Good afternoon, Madam Chair. Um, my name is Jonna Phillips. I'm the therapy director for Veterans Resilience Project. Um, I am a licensed EMDR therapist, a spouse of a veteran, and have served 23 years in the Air National Guard, uh, 12 years as an enlisted member, and then went to the dark side and became an officer. Um, I currently serve as the Director of Equal Opportunity at the 148th in Duluth as a traditional um, Air National Guard member. And I also work on the Sexual Harassment Task Force for the Minnesota Air National Guard. So 
by the combining those positions, I'm really passionate about being here today and speaking to all of you. Um, as, that, as has already been stated, we are a nonprofit, um, and we work tirelessly to, um, to reduce barriers to care to veterans. Um, we specifically treat post-traumatic stress disorder, trauma, including military sexual trauma, amongst Minnesota veterans and service members. We do this by providing awareness of EMDR therapy, which stands for Eye Movement Desensitization and Reprocessing. Uh, we have provided a handout with an extensive list of research that um, has been done on EMDR therapy specifically to veterans. Um, however, there's also a comprehensive list of research for EMDR therapy in general and its effectiveness. However, that was 77 pages long. Um, so I did not print that out for you today. Um, BRP is currently working with two possibilities for additional research um, to include the veteran spouses. We are working with the University of Minnesota Family Social Science Department, as well as the EMDR Research Foundation and reaching out to the National Institute of Health. Uh, with the funding, we have been able to increase the number of therapists in our network in the past year from 20 to 40. Um, so we have 40 MDR therapists statewide. Uh, our goal is to continue to increase that number. We do provide an, an advanced EMDR therapy training specifically for these traumaologists. Um, we are hosting our next one in Duluth in May um, to continue to expand our efforts to the northern part of the state. Uh, <clears throat> EMDR therapy, it's important to note, not only treats PTSD and complex PTSD and military sexual trauma, it can also prevent symptoms, including suicide, suicidal ideation, if traumas are treated earlier enough. Um, this is what's called an early intervention protocol. Uh, it's used to treat recent traumatic events um, such as national disasters, humanitarian crisis, first responders, police officers, and our military personnel, and has been found to be extremely effective. Um, we now have a dedicated outreach coordinator for this, the metro area. His name is Zachary Bensfield. He is a veteran himself, served in OIF from, and uh, deployed during 2006 to 2007. So we're really excited to have him join our team. Um, and we're working to expand another outreach coordinator again in the Duluth area to focus our efforts on northern, uh, northern Minnesota. Um, we are here today to ask you to continue to support us and to con allow us to expand our services to spouses. Through the events that we attended this last year in 2022, spouses continued to come up to us and identify their own invisible wounds. This is often due to spices heightened focus on the veterans' mental health and energy needed to minimize the impact on trauma on the family. As a military spouse, I can tell you we normalize separations, moves, isolation, Witnessing PTSD symptoms, compassion fatigue, loss, unexpected family stressors as something we do without recognizing the impacts on our own mental health. Uh, I remember once stating to a friend while my pa partner was gone for only three months um, for training, um, and I had a one-year-old, an 11-year-old, a 13-year-old, my own private practice, and my own military duty, um, that I was really thankful that it was just three months and for training and not a deployment. And she gently reminded me that this was not normal. As a licensed EMDR therapist, I can tell you I've seen my military spouses struggle to find access to their own therapy due to insurances and access to therapists who understand the military culture. Uh, I have worked with military spouses that have lost their spouse to death by suicide. Um, I have worked with a spouse that um, partner was deployed and their infant was in the ICU. Spouse who was attacked while sleeping due to military spouse's nightmares and flash flashbacks. Spouses who took care of a child with severe disability during deployment and isolated in a rural area with minimal resources. And spouses who experienced trauma due to untreated PTSD leading to substance abuse and emotional abuse. The addition of the spouse would uh, utilize funding that's already in place for BRP, um, and um, this would continue our funding through the next biennium. I just want to end today by sharing a few statements of veterans who have recently reached out requesting EMDR therapy. One stated, I feel that I'm struggling with some trauma. I have difficulty with sleep, both falling and staying asleep, ir irritability, anger, and I'm easily startled. 
the next stated, I struggle with depression, anxiety, nightmares, probably moral injury, suicidal ideation at times. The next stated, I can't seem to manage my life. I have frequent panic attacks and anxiety attacks. I feel hopeless. The next stated, I am reaching out for my partner who is experiencing some PTSD, grief after two deployments and losing a close friend to suicide. Please do not hesitate to let us know if you have any questions today, and we look forward to your support of Senate File 1509. We do have two testimonies of veterans who received EMDR therapy. Thank you so much. Um, our first uh, testifier, Jacob Thomas. Uh, if you could state your name for the record and begin when you're ready. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Jacob Thomas. I live just across the river over in Minneapolis in downtown. Uh, I served in the United States Air Force from 2008 to 2016. Uh, and I'm also the communications director for a group called Common Defense, where the, nation, the nation's largest grassroots organization of veterans uh, building community power to enact progressive policy across the country. Uh, and I come today also in support of SF-1509. And I want to take a brief moment uh, to reflect on the fact that yesterday was the 20th anniversary of the US-led invasion uh, in Iraq. Uh, 20 years of war has defined a generation of service members and our nation. The disastrous policy decisions that led us into war two decades ago have created countless veterans, civilians, and military family members who now live with the traumas of war. And this is all without including the stain of military sexual trauma uh, that has plagued our military branches for years. According to research done by the White House since 2010, more than 71,000 veterans have died by suicide, which is more than the total number of deaths from combat during Vietnam and operations in Iraq and Afghanistan combined. An important aspect to these statistics is that post-9-11 veterans like myself, those who served during uh, the terrorist attack in 2001 and then in wars in Iraq and Afghanistan as well as what has become known as the global war on terror, are being di diagnosed with PTSD at a much higher rate than their previous era veterans. Uh, brief numbers here on that. Uh, according to the Department of Veteran Affairs, approximately 7% of all veterans will experience PTSD at, the, at some point in their lives. Uh, however, for post-9-11 veterans, that number is a staggering 29% according as a subset uh, with regard to their service era. Incidents of PTSD are also higher among women veterans. 13% of women veterans experience PTSD uh, as opposed to approximately 6% of male veterans overall. And we also know that the secondary traumatic stress, uh, or what is known as secondary PTSD, can affect military spouses, caregivers, and family members, yet typically goes unaddressed and underserved. One of my roles while on active duty and later in the reserves was as a sexual assault victim's advocate, working with service members and their families to deal with military sexual trauma, both in navigating potential civilian court cases or courts marshals, uh, and with navigating medical and therapeutic case management. I first learned about EMDR way back when, uh, while I was working on a case uh, in 2013. Throughout the years and cases I worked, I saw firsthand how valuable therapies like EMDR can be to help people, service members, veterans, and their family members deal with PTSD and the stress that comes along with that. Uh, and as a veteran living with PTSD myself and a survivor of military sexual trauma, I would urge this committee to vote in favor of SF 1509 to help our service members and their families heal. The families of our service members play a crucial role in serving and sacrificing for this nation, just as their partners do. Thank you very much. Thank you. I appreciate your testimony. Our final testifier is Tom McKenna, who is joining us virtually. If you could state your name for the record and begin when you're ready. Thank you. So I'm, I'm Tom McKenna, and I'm glad to be here today to uh, tell a little story about me and, and VRP. And um, it was a, um, I was actually going through a therapy at the VA that um, required me to delve deeply into um, my trauma and the traumatic events that, that spurred uh, the, the PTSD diagnosis. And it was so um, destructive that I was suicidal. And I just decided. Um, I'm going to make one more phone call, and that was to VRP because I had heard about this EMDR from a friend, and um, they picked up the phone, and within a week, I was with an EMDR therapist, and the next, over the next 15 weeks, um, we worked through um, 
we worked through those issues that that had me in that in that terrible state, and it was just unbelievable um, to um, experience a therapy that um, didn't require me to go back into my trauma as much as it did to look at it from an objective point of view and really um, uh, it saved my life and um, I can't thank VRP enough for that. I'm here today um, because of, of VRP and my wife would say the same. Um, we, um, my wife and I, we subsequently went on to start a nonprofit of our own which now serves thousands of veterans and um, we would never would have been here without uh, VRP and uh, EMDR therapy. And so um, when, I, when I think about VRP, um, it's always a thought of hope and it's always a thought of um, the, an option that's out there that can be really effective for veterans who are experiencing um, especially complex PTSD. And so um, I uh, just wanted to be here today on their behalf to say um, thank you to them and to say thank you to the legislature for supporting them and hopefully that support continues. And um, I just, uh, I owe my life, I mean that in the literal sense. So um, thank you. Thank you, Mr. McKenna. Uh, members, any questions? Mr. Senator Anderson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I see we have, um, the, I guess the funding has been laid level or remained the same. But by adding the, it says here, more than a third of the war veteran spouses meet the criteria for secondary traumatic stress. Um, <clears throat> how many veteran spouses are we talking about with, when it says one third? More than one third, uh, and then what is the criteria for meeting that uh, level of need for this program? Let Senator Mitchell, Major, oh, go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair um, and Senator Anderson. Um, the one third, that's from the research. Um, so that's a national research study that was cited there. Um, and so we can just base that off of statistics that we could expect one third of spouses in Minnesota um, to have secondary PTSD. There's diagnosable criteria to meet that, not that different than a diagnosis of PTSD, um, such as sleep disturbances, irritability, um, but there would be uh, several um, criteria needed to be met, and we um, do an intake process that would identify that. And, and there's also um, traumatic, um, there's a, a diagnosis for trauma as well. So that could be, again, the single incidence uh, trauma. So, um, you know, the reference to the spouse who was attacked in the night um, by her uh, partner who had PTSD um, with his flashbacks, um, that would be like a single incident trauma, which is also diagnosable. Sandra Anderson. Thank you. Um, so how many sessions does an individual, whether it's a male or female, need to, uh, to, or is it there is no answer to that? Well, the research really shows that within 12 sessions, you can see significant decrease in the symptoms. Um, what we are finding is what um, uh, Mr. McKenna was referencing with complex PTSD that often can be longer. Um, and I've seen that with um, military members or veterans who have been deployed and in combat and have seen um, quite a bit, and so they might require um, a bit longer um, with the complex PTSD diagnosis. Madam Chair. Senator Anderson. It says here that you have trained 40 EMDR therapists in Minnesota. How many are still with you? 40, um, and that continues to grow with our training in May. Um, so these EMDR therapists are already EMDR therapists. I just want to make sure that's um, understood. And then we provide an advanced training on how to work with military members, and that's a, a prerequisite about uh, as, as far as being a part of our network. Um, so that is an additional um, training required for them to be a referral resource. Madam Chair. Senator Anderson. It says that this uh, Veterans Resilience Project will grant funds uh, to, I'm guessing, the therapists that are going to be doing the work. What are the size of the, the grants? Um, so the, I'm not sure what that's referencing. Um, 
We, provi we reimburse the therapist directly for the therapy sessions. Um, so um, the therapy, the therapy is, uh, rate is $125 an hour, which is comparable um, to um, what you would see as far as an outpatient, um, if I took a self-pay client as a therapist. Um, it's competitive, and so we really pride ourselves uh, being an organization that supports not only the veterans, but the therapists taking care of veterans as well. Um, some of the insurances, such as TRICARE, is very complex for medical professionals to join their network or to take. Um, and a lot of our therapists are actually a part of Optum, which is the re referral resource um, of the VA. Madam Chair. Senator Anderson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so uh, Optum, I've seen that name before. Uh, what I'm wondering is this 400,000 that we're ha having uh, provided to Veterans Resilience, what percent uh, of that money is going to be used for administrative costs? Uh, Dr. Phillips. Yes, Madam Chair and Senator Anderson. Um, so our funding as far as administration is 15%. 43% of our funding goes to these trainings that we provide the therapist as well as program costs. And then 42.5% goes directly to reimburse the therapist for the EMDR therapy. That's taking care of the veterans. So Madam Chair. Senator Anderson. These um, uh, locations uh, for these 40 therapists, are they in the Twin Cities? Are they statewide or where are they located? Madam Chair and yeah. Senator Anderson, great question. They are located throughout the state of Minnesota. And um, right now, I would say, um, I'm looking at the map, uh, and we I can get that map to you as well. Um, but we do have, for example, six located in Duluth. Um, and then we also have several that are located in north, um, north central um, Minnesota, and they are part of the tribal communities as well. Um, so we do have therapists in the rural communities, and then 20 of our therapists provide telehealth option as well, um, allowing access to uh, rural communities as well. But that is our focus as we continue to grow and expand, is to continue to not only outreach to veterans and service members, but therapists um, in these rural communities. Madam Chair. Senator Anderson, then we have to go to Re Senator May Quaid. Rather than, um, do these people have to be re referred to your therapy, or can they go directly to you? Major Phillips. Madam Chair and Senator Anderson, they can come directly to us. Um, I would say the majority um, of our referrals right now are from events that we have gone to. Um, we went to about 20 different events this past year um, targeting veterans and service members. Um, and then a lot are referred or find us through our website. And then some are referred from the VA. Um, but as mentioned earlier too, we actually just had a meeting with regions and their community um, health coordinator. Um, and so we're, we receive referrals from different areas. And Madam Chair, last question. Okay, thank you, Senator Anderson. Do you have a report of the results that you've, uh, I didn't see anything in here to show results of your work in the last years that you've been doing this? Yeah, uh, Madam Chair yeah. and Senator Anderson, we do have a pilot program that we conducted in 2014. And from that, and that's again on our website and included in our le legislative report that we provided. Um, it, it's not here today, but we have emailed that out previously, uh, where 100% of veterans um, and service members that received EMDR therapy saw a reduction in their symptoms, and 87% completed the treatment, which is also a significant statistic um, due to a high dropout rate for veterans. Thank you. Senator McQueen. Well, thank you, Madam Chair. And Senator Mitchell, I want to thank you for bringing this bill, and Jacob, and um, was it... Major Phillips? You can call me John. <laughs> Thank you for, for bringing this. Um, I am not a veteran, but EMDR definitely saved my life. And I graduated from high school in 2004, and so I'm of the generation that spent an entire generation at war. And I have no less than four friends that I recommended to, to do EMDR for their PTSD after returning home from service because of how incredibly effective it is and how 
Um, I mean, it literally saved my life. And so I think of this as like if we had um, like a strep outbreak and we were like, hey, we're going to give everyone amoxicillin. Um, it would do a really huge part in, in reducing strep except people who might be allergic to amoxicillin. Um, but so I, I just, this is like, I really, this is more for the committee. Like this is a, an incredibly effective, um, self-directed, um, non-traumatic way to process trauma. And the um, results around it are incredible. It has been around since the 80s. The woman who discovered it um, was experiencing her own trauma and taking walks. And then she was looking, eye movement, desensitization, reprocessing, you move your eyes back and forth. And she was looking from the trees to the lake to the trees to the lake and she was noticing that her, her experiences were becoming less intense and she was processing something and she was a researcher and a scientist and she like discovered it this way. Um, an incredibly important thing that we can do for those who have served our country. And so I, I'm just so grateful to have this in front of this committee and for, for the work that you're doing and hopefully we can continue to grow and expand this and get people access to it, so thank you. Thank you. Members, seeing no other questions, Senate file 1509 will be laid over for possible inclusion in the omnibus. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to Chair Murphy. Thank you. Senator Howe, we're going to invite Senator Housley up, and then you, if you don't mind. Forgive me, please. <laughs> kindness, kindness is a virtue. <laughs> Members, we will take up Senate file 2420. Welcome to the committee, Senator Housley. Please introduce yourself for the record and proceed. Thank you so much, Madam Chair. Uh, Madam Chair and committee members, thank you for the opportunity to bring Senate File 2420, a funding request on behalf of the Forest Lake Area Veterans Memorial Committee. Uh, military veterans of Forest Lake have patriotically served our country and some have even given their life. They deserve to be honored with the Veterans Memorial in the Lakeside Memorial Park located downtown Forest Lake. We are requesting matching funds of $225,000 for a $450,000 project. It's a one-time appropriation. Uh, and with me, I have testifiers uh, for, for the Forest Lake Veterans Memorial Committee, Ron Miller, Army Colonel, retired, and Mark Finneman, Army Sergeant. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Housley. Welcome to the committee. Um, please introduce yourself for the record and testify. Yes. I'm. Ron Miller, I'm a uh, retired colonel. I was in the uh, active duty seven years and then the Minnesota Army National Guard aviation for uh, 18 years. Sorry, uh, Senator Lang uh, stepped out, but the, uh, and then in the Army Reserves for the total of 30 years. And I'm the chairman of the Forest Lake Veterans Memorial Committee. Uh, we started, it's a community group uh, organized in uh, 2008 and under the prodding of a World War II veteran, uh, Al Ewart. Uh, he's uh, since uh, deceased a few years ago. But our goal was and is to honor veterans, either living or deceased, by having a memorial site in the Lakeside Memorial Park, and, which is downtown Forest Lake. Uh, we reinstalled a, uh, a brown, bronze plaque, which was done in the 1970s, and it lists uh, 24 names of people that uh, veterans who had uh, served their country and, and, and died uh, in service. Um, the Chamber of Commerce uh, did that one and then things were quiet for a long time and so Al prodded us to, to go ahead and, and we need to honor some more um, more people since then and, and all. So we, uh, we got together and we ended up, um, uh, we put that this on a rock, uh, that plaque installed it in the park, uh, and then uh, we we ended up um, having a team. In uh, about 2008, 2009, we started selling uh, pavers uh, like this. Uh, this is the smaller one, four inches by eight inches, and it has the, the veteran's name on the top. And then you know what 
whether they're Army, Navy, or, or whatever, and uh, you know, their rank, and et cetera, and then at the bottom, the years of their service. And so this is a smaller size. We sold those for $150 and a larger size, which is 8 inches by 16 inches for uh, $300 each. And so that netted, um, uh, well, after 300 and 37 we have in the in the ground right now next to a sidewalk uh, downtown uh, park uh, madam chair and uh, So that netted some money plus uh, other donations. So we do have sixty three thousand uh, dollars so far uh, And we are going to continue this uh, every every uh, twice a year uh, anyone who submitted a um, uh, For one of these they the money goes to the city of Forest Lake a, a pot for us So it's not me as a chairman or whatever, touching the money, it goes to that pot at the city, and you can look on the city uh, website about the Veterans Memorial. Um, and then twice a year, I get the the new um, orders, and I talk to the the person, and and whether it's uh, uh, someone who's alive or deceased, I uh, end up talking to the family members then, and we go ahead and uh, decide what should be you know appropriate for them on this on this paver. And we install those on Memorial Day, and then we also install the other uh, half on uh, uh, Veterans Day. So we're up to 337 uh, at this point. So we um, we need the you know funding to uh, go on from there, and uh, veterans and their loved ones, as well as thousands of others, will directly benefit. As many citizens will be motivated to answer the nation's call uh, to serve in time of need. So, Madam Chair, I'd like to have uh, Mark Finneman is on our uh, committee. Um, there's a representative, Bob Detmer, was on our original committee also. We have a committee that has the uh, a city hall person and the uh, Forest Lake uh, Chamber and the VFW chaplain. I happen to be the American Legion chaplain, uh, a wide variety of people from the community. Um, so, Mark. Mr. Finneman, welcome yes. to the committee. Please Thank introduce you. yourself for the record. Mark Finneman. I was a, <clears throat> I was a Vietnam era veteran. So that uh, since then I've been part of the Economic Development Authority of Forest Lake, and in doing so, I became very aware of our, in our studies for downtown and what would happen in the future and how to realize the potential. The idea of this memorial became a very big feature of this story. The memorial is directly downtown, uh, at the core of our downtown, the core of a major intersection, and its entry to the primary entry to the. Um, Lakeside Memorial Park. The Memorial Park title is based on this memorial taking place. So it's for this memorial. We're just now starting to realize this memorial idea because we've formulated a design that we can really start to perpetuate and price and install and uh, fund for. So if you can look up at the screen or your, your computers, it is a um, formulated around a central sculpture. Uh, this is the primary uh, public art display of Forest Lake. There's not a better site for this to happen in. And that, uh, so we, we expect it to be a very strong sculpture. It's a central sculpture that's formulated on top of a pedestal to give it status. And then it's, um, let's see, this one? Yep. They're probably best seen from here. Uh, it's on the pedestal. The pedestal just gives it some strength and stature. It's like an, a rock outcropping in northern Minnesota with an old cypress tree, you know, extended out of it. And upon that cypress tree are a few eagles, the well done realism in eagles. So there's an abstract nature to this in that it's sort of like a, a battle scene as well, where arising out of the stone is the, the enduring tree, and the tree now has growth, new growth down at the base, and up where the remaining branches are will be these two really well done bronze sculptures of eagles in different orientations and trying to incorporate the whole park so there's no one view that it's taking. Everything around that is three raised platforms where we're going to get those pavers off the ground, get them up to a more prestigious level, about 16 inches off the ground, and into a nice confined architecture that's there. Uh, so we're providing those raised platforms in which the pavers will be set. And surrounding those, that raised platforms are six sentinels. The six sentinels are uh, sculptures that are each representing one of the services. And each will have a medallion of that service represented on it, as well as an opportunity to speak to information about that particular service. And they're all leaning in toward this central sculpture. Everything is leading into this round form. Um, 
all the sidewalks from the city park that are there, the ones you see surrounding it right now are truly just part of a park systems that there. We have flags that are already there. We're installing a new American flag in a very key location because one of these central areas you see to the right has got a kiosk where there'll be information installed in that kiosk. Uh, it's an open proposition. And when you open that up, there will be information inside, something to educate people with, something to talk about what the memorial's all about. And so this is our idea to settle in, and, and there could be all sorts of interactive things that we can incorporate in the future. We also have an independent soldier you see in far right as well that is uh, standing there saluting the flag and facing the central sculpture as well. Uh, that has a, a connection to a particular soldier in Forest Lake that's uh, really initiated a lot of this effort. So the sculptures and, uh, and the paver location I think is uh, really significant and strong and it, it's a low rise proposition that there's the, the various sentinels that travel around the outside and there's the informational kiosk. And that's what it looks like to kind of view it. It's a low-rise structure except for the central uh, sculpture. And so it's not intruding that much on the park. It offers places for people to sit and be as well as uh, view. And so it's just viewed from a couple places. I'm not sure how well you'll see that. But there's essentially the sculpture that would sit in the middle. We're expecting it to be a, a fairly fine art proposition, so we're trying to uh, ensure that it has the budget necessary to be something strong, a signature piece for the park, and a signature piece for the memorial and the, the memori memorizing the, uh, the veterans that have served. Uh, we have done run budgets on this to a certain extent on political, on the uh, preliminary front, and so we have a sense of what it's gonna cost to do this, and that's what we're coming forward to help us do some funding. Thank you very much for your testimony, Mr. Finneman. Senator Housley. Uh, again, thank you, Madam Chair and members, for giving us the opportunity to be heard. Members, do you have questions for Madam Senator Chair. Housley? Uh, Senator Anderson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Senator uh, Housley, uh, I, I, you probably don't know the answer, but I was just wondering, do you know what the, admit, what the Commissioner of Administration uh, will charge as far as an administrative fee for uh, giving you the giving Force Lake the grant for this? Usually there's an administrative fee that goes with it, and I was just talking, and just some have 5%, some have 2%, some have 15 The last bill, I think there was 15% that was being equated for the Veterans Resilience Program. So just asking the question on, on the fee that the state charges for administrating the grant. And you probably don't know, but. Madam Chair, Senator, uh, Senator Anderson, let's, let's hope it's 2%. Thank you, Senator Housley. Are there other questions? Senator Gustafson. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just want, I, I'm in your neighboring district, um, to the Lionel Lakes, Venice Heights, White Bear Lake area, but we, my kids play softball in your neck of the woods all the time. I think this is a beautiful place to have this. I think it's really, I had to look up where Lakeside Memorial Park is, but um, yeah, right there by the lake is so pretty. And my husband and I are one of the, or those people that go to every one of these things, and we read all the si highway markers, and yeah, we're kind of like that. So I'm excited for this, and I just wanted to say thank you to Senator Housley for bringing this forward. Thank you. Senator Housley. Any other questions, members? Final word, Senator Housley. Uh, again, Madam Chair, thank you so much for giving us this opportunity. Uh, thank you very much. With that, we will lay Senate File 2420 over for possible inclusion in the Veterans Omnibus Bill. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you for being here, and thank you for your service. Senator Howe. Thank you for your patience, Senator Howe. We have two Howe bills back-to-back, -back, Senate File 1290 and Senate File 2181. Do you have a preference of where you begin, Senator Howe? Uh, I would prefer, Madam Chair, to start with uh, 2181. All right. And we have before us Senate File 2181. Please introduce yourself for the record and proceed. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm Senator Jeff Howe. Uh, Senate File 2181 provides appropriations for the Minnesota Military and Veterans Museum. And Madam Chair, I need an oral amendment on line 1.7, change both 600,000 to 300,000. So it's a total of 600,000. Thank you, Senator Howe. Uh, would council uh, like to repeat that for us? 
Uh, Madam Chair, members on line 1.7, delete both 600,000 and insert 300,000. That's your amendment, Senator Howe? That is my amendment. Thank you, Senator Madam Lang Chair. will move that amendment. Uh, are there questions? Uh, seeing no questions, all those in favor, please say aye. Aye. And those opposed say no. And the amendment is adopted. Thank you, Madam Chair. And, and members, what this does is it, it helps fund the museum uh, for staff and provide direct services to veterans and their families. And uh, this is the new museum that's going to be built up on uh, uh, Highway 371 up by Camp Ripley. Uh, but we need to start working on actually appropriating the money and appropriating the, the staff and, and, and moving this. So with that, I'll turn to my testifiers, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator Howe. Uh, welcome to the committee. If you'd like to introduce yourself for the record and proceed with your testimony. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Randall Dietrich, Executive Director of the Minnesota Military and Veterans Museum at Camp Ripley. Um, thanks for having us here today. I uh, appreciate it. Um, you know, for many, many years, the museum has held a special place in the hearts of many veterans uh, and their families for decades, and they continue to seek us out this day and every day. Uh, we're open year-round. Uh, they come to us for help and care with their photographs and uniforms, with their stories, uh, to find their friends, and to see themselves in the company of other world-class veterans, and that's been going on for decades at this point. If you come through our door currently at Camp Ripley, there's a very good chance you'll be greeted by our archivist, our curator, our director will be at the front desk to greet people when they do come through the door. And this personal connection is one that we take very, very seriously and one that's important to us. Uh, it's, it's a humbling and awesome responsibility to engage veterans in this way as they enter the door uh, to share their stories with us that are so dear to them. Um, we're also happy to host um, countless other classrooms that come through our space. Uh, the Norex uh, exchange that was just at Camp Ripley visited our, our space as well um, recently. Um, more to the point, um, with new opportunities, as the Senator mentioned, come new challenges uh, for this new facility that we're currently developing, and our opportunity uh, is to engage veterans actively in that process, um, so that our staff essentially have to be in two places at once, one to be staffing the museum like we've always done, but also then to go out and engage veterans statewide to help craft their stories uh, that we are developing as part of this new museum experience that we're creating. Uh, and, and that means mobilizing people in ways that we haven't done before. Um, I do have some, some images I'm, I'm trying to share with you, but can't at the moment. Um, but uh, what it does speak to is uh, our veterans, uh, David Geister in Minneapolis, who's a Marine veteran uh, who is sculpting uh, mannequins. Mannequins are often used in museums. They are now. Uh, we can order mannequins from Amazon or pick up a catalog and do that. Uh, that's not what we're endeavoring to do. So David Geister, uh, who, if you know him by reputation, a gifted artist and Marine veteran, is actually taking the time to customize, craft those mannequin pieces uh, for a, a Nisei soldier uh, who has a very different look than the kind of soldiers that you might be able to download from Amazon uh, and working with uh, the Japanese American Citizens League and the 34th Division headquarters where this will be installed shortly. But that kind of customization work, including a veteran, uh, working with us to customize these mannequins to tell an accurate story about the Minnesota veterans, including Nisei soldiers in World War II that made such an incredible contribution. Uh, these are ways that we are working forward uh, in our museum to engage veterans to help us in this process. Uh, I'll provide two other brief examples to you. One, uh, we acquired the USS Minneapolis submarine, which is a nuclear class submarine. We had a, a nuclear class uh, veteran uh, submariner here earlier. Um, working with Governor Walls, we uh, had that submarine pieces, the sail and the rudder, transported here to the state of Minnesota uh, last year. Um, it needs f uh, extensive restoration uh, because it does not look the way that we want it to look when it will be in installed in our new museum. But to do that, uh, we want to engage veterans, veterans who know submarines, and there are no fewer than at least 111 submariners in Minnesota who have self-identified uh, as part of an association that wants to help this process. So another example of David Geister or um, the submarine group in Minnesota working together with us to develop uh, this new uh, experience that we're creating for this facility. Um, the last one I would identify for you, uh, a glider that we recovered from uh, a northern Minnesota barn. Uh, gliders are used in World War II as glider trainers prior to D-Day. Uh, we've re uh, recovered that piece. We're restoring it. And now we're working with an organization in, in Hutchinson, which also is replete with veterans, uh, preserving these pieces of history. So all these are examples of us working statewide with veterans out in the community 
while at the same time uh, maintaining the current um, level of support we have at our, our current space. Uh, these funds would allow us to do both at the same time, and I appreciate your, con your, your consideration. Thank you very much. Members, are there questions for Senator Howe? I have just one question for you or for your testifier when I look at the language of the bill. Mm -hmm. As I listen to the testimony, this, the work that you're going to be doing with the veterans is around narrative, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, the language says provide direct services to veterans and their families, which seems fairly expansive. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm just wondering, uh, I, I just suggest you pr think about that a little bit. If, if I mean, direct services mean so many things. Um, and I don't know that you mean uh, like direct physical services to uh, veterans. Yes. Uh Chairman, uh, yes, Chairman. it would be a number of those things. One, conducting oral histories. Two, uh, providing assistance to them and caring for those uniforms. Like I mentioned, that that ongoing work is very important. As well as, uh, when available, uh, putting them kind of to work. Because uh, when we talk about veteran resiliency, uh, having them have a hand in developing this new facility that we're, uh, hopefully as the state of Minnesota, committed to making happen. And thank you for that. Uh, it's a great opportunity for them to walk through this new space that we do envision in a couple years and see their work uh, hanging from the ceiling or are on the parade ground. Thank you, Mr. Diedrich. Senator Howe. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I think uh, what I think a lot of people don't understand is one of the things and one of the, one of the things that really helps veterans reintegrate into the society is actually being able to go to places like this, meet their other fellow soldiers there, have those events. So I think it, it's, a, it's a real help to reintegrate our soldiers back into, into civilian life. Yeah, Senator Howe, I appreciate that. Senator Mitchell. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I, I could be misremembering, but I don't think I am. Wasn't there some money for this in last week's bonding bill that didn't go through? Senator the, Howe. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank, for the, thank you for the question, Senator Mitchell. But that is actually bonding money for the construction. This is actually money appropriation for the actual uh, hiring of staff and, and the actual uh, facility itself. So uh, this is actually providing the services and the, and the extra stuff that isn't incorporated into the bonding bill. So this is a separate appropriation. Senator Mitchell. So, but, so people, in, including yourself, voted against some of the money for the project, but now we're going to allocate money for staff. Is that, am I understanding that correctly? Senator Howe. Uh, well, uh, and I will, if we want to have that discussion here, we can have that discussion here. I, I did, voted against that bill for, because I, I do believe we need to listen to all Minnesotans, which we are currently, I don't believe we are with that bonding bill. I still have bonding projects coming in, and there's some belief out there that we're going to have two bites at the apple, two bonding bills. I personally think it's difficult enough to get one across the, the line. I don't believe we're going to get two bites of that apple. So I want to make sure that the, the communities that I have that don't, aren't represented in that bonding bill have an opportunity to get into that bonding bill. And actually, because there's sewer projects and water projects that are, I'm still getting requests for, I want to make sure that they're actually in that bonding bill. I think there's plenty of time before the end of session to vote for a bonding bill. I want one just as bad as anyone else. And this is my, this is, I'm a supportive of this project, but I want to see all the other communities that I represent get a fair shake also. Thank you, Senator Lang. Seeing no further questions, Senator Lang, uh, I will move to lay uh, Senate file 2181 over for possible inclusion in the Veterans Omnibus Bill. Thank, Thank you. you, Madam Chair. And next, Senate File 1290, and then we'll move to Senate File 1649. Senator Howe. Thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, Senate File uh, 1290, what this does is appropriate some money for, uh, for the post-9-11 veterans uh, bonuses. Uh, we already had some of this go on, but uh, we uh, came up a little uh, short on the appropriation. There's more veterans out there than, that have applied and received. Uh, so this actually appropriates 
uh, an additional funding to actually see that through and uh, actually give money to, to everyone. I, I, I'm one of those that haven't applied yet. This, <laughs> uh, not sure I'm going to, but uh, there's a lot of veterans out there that haven't been uh, compensated with, their, with the appropriate bonus. So I believe uh, I have a testifier by, from the Department of Veterans Affairs, Ben Johnson, if he wants to come and elaborate exactly to the numbers that uh, are appropriate. Thank you, Senator Howe. Mr. Ben Johnson, welcome to the committee. I believe this is one of a number of proposals dealing with this subject matter, um, Senator Howe. Um, so, Ben Johnson, please introduce yourself uh, for the record and proceed. Uh, Chair Murphy, members of the committee, my name is Ben Johnson. I'm the Legislative Director for the Minnesota Department of Veterans Affairs and a, uh, a general fund increase of $22 million in FY24 uh, in support of this initiative is included in the governor's recommended uh, uh, bill, which we heard um, just earlier today. Um, the goal in, in our uh, effort would be to make sure that all, all Minnesota's post-9-11 service members are, are able to receive this funding, um, adding additional money, and our goal was also to increase eligibility to make sure that it didn't matter where you started your service so long as you're a current resident of the state of Minnesota and served during that the 20-year time frame outlined that you would be eligible to receive uh, this, this um, bonus. Uh, the other part that we're looking to do that's not included in this specific language would be adding that Inherent Resolve Campaign Medal, um, which takes care of some, uh, some, in particular, Minnesota Guard members who deployed after the Iraq Campaign Medal was no longer eligible for them. Um, but this would allow those members to receive the, the mid-tier bonus, which is the $1,200 amount that currently exists. Um, and uh, our goal, again, is to, is to reach 85% of all veterans who we estimate to be eligible in the state of Minnesota. Um, there are no hard numbers, but the VA estimate for, for current residents of that, of that generation are just under 50,000. Um, so I hope that answers the question, sir. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Members, are there questions? All right, then. Seeing no, for, no further questions, we will. I will move delay seven. Senate, I will move uh, that Senate File twelve ninety be laid over for possible inclusion in the Veterans Omnibus Bill. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you very much for your testimony. Thank, Thank you for being here and your patience. Thanks for the opportunity. Senator Lang. Senator Lang has a couple of bills before us today as well: sixteen forty nine and twenty one eighteen. Let us know what you'd like to begin with, Senator Lang. Well, thank you, Madam Chair and the members. Um, I think we'll maybe go out of order from the, the test, with the testifier here today. Um, and I'll start with Senate File 2118. All right. We have Senate File 2118 before us. Senator Lang, So, proceed. Madam Chair, this is the best kind of uh, bill that we can talk about because it's only a paragraph long and doesn't take much time. So with that, it's uh, $2 million uh, for veteran service organizations. This is something that I've uh, been working on for quite a few years. I've uh, been working on for quite a few years with uh, Senator Newton uh, in particular and uh, a couple of reps from the House uh, that are no longer with us now. I mean, they're still with us, but they're not in the body. Excuse me. Uh, they're in their geez, body. They're, they're both going to give me grief body. about that. Uh, but uh, I, th I think it's, it's a valid group. It's a, a group that really uh, uh, goes above and beyond kind of after the fact, uh, after deployments, after service. And, uh, you know, to be honest, there's a, there's a bunch of uh, veteran service organizations that mean a lot to the vets and the groups that they represent. So... Uh, with, without going too much more into that, uh, I'm trying to remember. I don't know if we've actually met Rachel Hill. Very nice to meet you. Uh, yes. Welcome to the, the Veterans Day on the Hill, Thanks. sort of, or in sake of. <laughs> <laughs> welcome to the committee. Please introduce yourself for the record and proceed. Thank you, Madam Chair. My name is Rachel Hill, and I believe I'm actually a testifier on the other bill for the veteran. The, the, the hat got letter. me. <laughs> We're happy to have you on both bills. <laughs> well, well thanks, with, Madam Chair. with that, Madam Chair, I guess I'd stand for questions. <laughs> Members, uh, do we have questions for Senator Lang? This is an important piece of legislation, though brief on a piece of paper. It has uh, an important impact. Right. 
Absolutely. Senator yes. Anderson. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I, I guess I'm going to ask the same question I asked Senator Housley. Do you know what the administrative cost is for, vet, for Veterans Affairs, what they charge for putting these grants out to um, the VSO? Madam Senator Chair, Lang. Uh, I didn't hear what Senator Housley's answer was, so I'll give you mine. Uh, okay. uh, my, my assumption would be that the, uh, the administrative costs would be covered by any administrative uh, fees or any uh, departmental budgetary allotments that we as legislature would give, and I would hope that this wouldn't add anything to that. I don't know if that's a good answer or not. Well, I, there's so many Senator different... Senator Anderson. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. So there's so many different people come in with different numbers and different agencies are asking for different percentages to, to deal with this. So I'm just trying to figure out if there maybe the maybe members from the <laughs> I, I know he said he didn't have his math hat on today, so maybe he doesn't still have the math hat on. But Welcome I thought back maybe to the committee. Uh, Chair, members Ben Johnson, legislative director MDVA. Uh, this one's a relatively easy answer. Uh, Chair Murphy, Senator, um, this one, we, we have a grants management team. We have a one FT and then a half FT that does all of our grants management. We're interested in, in securing additional uh, support for that effort, but this particular bill, uh, the administrative inclusion, wouldn't be, there would be zero additional out of this appropriation because we already do grants management in-house, in sir. Senator Anderson. Thank you. Thanks. Members, are there further questions for Senator Lang? And seeing no further questions, I'll move to lay Senate File 2118 over for possible inclusion in the Veterans Omnibus Bill. Senate File 1649, Senator Lang. Well, thank you, Madam Chair. So this one uh, is kind of a fix-up bill, and I, I know that Mr. Johnson didn't get up for a very good reason because we've been working on this one for a while as well. Uh, this is something that uh, Senator, or excuse me, Representative Eklund probably owes a little bit of credit for as we last year did have the Veterans Omnibus Bill for the first time. And part of that was the post 9-11 service bonus. Now we had a really in-depth discussion last year on how the heck were we going to implement that? How are we going to give that, that post service bonus? Whose citizens, how much the, the value would be, and how many veterans would be eligible for that? Uh, so we, we made our best guess is really where we started from. Uh, the problem with our best guess is it wasn't good enough. So here we are in front of you again this year, uh, kind of predictively so, I think a little bit. Uh, we had that discussion last year. So what this does is it expands the term of what resident veteran is. Um, last year, uh, we talked about, you know, there's a, a, a number of people within my own unit that come from other states. They don't live in Minnesota, but they serve Minnesota. Or what about those veterans that live in Minnesota and serve another state? Would they be eligible for this? And uh, it, this is hopefully, uh, and then it includes a little part of OH, OIR, Operation Inherent Resolve, 2014-2015, uh, a little group called ISIS that uh, stirred up a little trouble in the Middle East. That's where that uh, campaign medal came from. Uh, so with that, this is, is a fix-up bill, and I think I'd uh, taken enough of your time to let testify or testify. Welcome. Welcome to the committee. Please introduce yourself for the record and proceed. Thank you, Madam Chair. My name is Rachel Hill. I am the comptroller for the American Legion, an Air Force veteran, and a Gold Star spouse. To give a little background about myself, I spent most of my childhood growing up in Moorhead, Minnesota before moving out of state for my dad's job. I graduated high school out of Cleveland, Ohio, and enlisted right after graduation in 1997. I met my husband, Jeff, shortly after, while we were both in technical training school. In 2010, Jeff was killed in the line of duty when his C-17 went down during a training mission in Alaska, where we were stationed at the time. After his death, I chose to move back to Minnesota with our two small sons to be closer to family. Now, in regards to the post-9-11 bonus, I am currently excluded as it discriminates against active duty veterans by stating that the veteran must be a current Minnesota resident and that their home of record when they entered military service is a Minnesota address, which mine is not. While Guard and Reserve members are likely to sign up and remain in Minnesota, this is generally not the case with active duty. Active duty members are often stationed all around the globe and choose to make Minnesota their home after their service, but yet our state tells them it's not 
doesn't count because they didn't enter service from here. No other veterans benefit in Minnesota is based on whether they entered service from Minnesota or a different state. Our state has no such residency requirements for any other programs. And we don't restrict benefits because you were born in a different state. I presently qualify for the Minnesota GI Bill as a veteran. I was on active duty on September 11th, as well as multiple years after. Had an honorable discharge. I earned the Global War on Terrorism Medal, but yet I do not qualify for the post 9-11 bonus, simply because I enlisted out of Ohio, which as an 18-year-old kid, that was something completely out of my control. I spent most of my childhood in Minnesota, returned after my husband was killed to raise my kids here, to be close to family. I pay taxes. I work to support Minnesota veterans. I volunteer in my community. I do my part to make Minnesota successful. But according to the specifications of the post 9-11 bill, as it, or the bonus, as it currently reads, I am not a valued veteran in the eyes of the state that I have cl always claimed as home. This is not what I believe Minnesota stands for. And that said, I ask that you consider amending the post 9-11 bonus to include all Minnesota resident veterans. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony and thank you for your service. And I'm thank really you, glad Madam you chose Chair. Minnesota. Thank you, Madam Chair. Senator Anderson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Senator Lang, uh, or to your testifier, um, or testifiers, um, how many individuals are in this same situation as Ms. Hill? Senator Lang. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And Senator Anderson, I don't know the answer to that question. Uh, that is, well, in, in the research leading up to this bill, and this is granted, it was uh, rather haphazardly thrown together last year, I have to admit. I shouldn't say haphazardly, I say it rapidly put together last year as we were uh, trying to get this bill passed and I believe April of last year. I don't think we started on it. So that was the question that we had uh, proposed to the department. And to be honest, I don't know if you even have the statistics that, that could back up exactly what those look like until those folks started applying for the bonus. Is that accurate? That's correct. So we, we truly don't know. Senator Thank Anderson. You. Thank you. Mr. Johnson. Uh, Chair Murphy, uh, Senator Anderson, the only additional um, sort of context is that we have, we have already uh, issued, uh, I think it's like 19,000 bonus checks from between last July 1st and I think this was within the last two weeks. Uh, so we know that the, the delta is somewhere between that 20,000 mark and the potential 50,000 that are in the state. Um, and if we get to the 85% that the Commissioner Herkey has, has identified as his target goal, that sort of sets up the parameters as best we can tell, sir. Senator Anderson. And, so, oh, go ahead. And maybe just a little add to that is that when you move to Minnesota, you don't, you don't testify to the fact that you're a veteran. That isn't something that's normally done in the natural scope of duty, I guess. So it is kind of an... Uh, and unknown as far as the agency and as far as the legislature is concerned. Uh, the intent is never to exclude uh, an eligible veteran, but uh, obviously we, we did. Senator Chair. Senator Anderson. Mr. Johnson, uh, you said you've paid out 19,000 19, people have been paid a bonus, uh, and you're guessing upwards of 50,000 maybe, or I'm just wondering if there have been inquiries to you or to the department re regarding the same situation? Mr. Johnson. Uh, Chair Murphy, Senator Anderson, absolutely. And that's, that's why we're here today to support this bill. We, we are doing everything we can to do all the outreach. We have, I think the average amount of uh, bonus over, the, over those 20,000 is about $1,700. So we have seen some that are, um, that are the 600 versus 1,200, either in country or not in country and then the 2,000 that are available to Gold Star families. Uh, so the amount is, the amount is there. Um, we think there's a pretty good cross-section of the state that would come forward and say, hey, I moved to Minnesota after my service, um, wasn't here, wasn't eligible, haven't applied. Um, but we're already outpacing the, nine, the, um, the 1991, the, the previous bonus for the Gulf War. Um, that, I think, averaged out to about 46% of eligible veterans actually claimed their bonus from that era, we're already outpacing that. And we, we think that this 
this uh, change would help us uh, manage the influx that we expect to see of uh, people who are going to come forward and say, hey, I, I would like to accept this as well. Um, it's, it's literally the least we can do as a state to recognize that service. Thank you. Are there further questions, members? Senator Mitchell. Um, this is just a clarification, Senator Lang. I think, I, I think you said um, if they live in another state and serve in Minnesota, I, but I believe it's the other way around, right? So if they lived in Iowa and served in Minnesota, they wouldn't get it because they're not a Minnesota resident. But if they live in Minnesota and serve in Iowa, they would get it because they're residing. It's, you have to reside in Minnesota. Is my, I just want to, because I didn't read it differently in here, and I just yeah, wanted to make that's sure. That's correct, Senator. Okay, thank you, Senator Lang. Sure. All right, then, seeing no further questions, Senator Lang, thanks for your work on this. Yeah, uh, I appreciate it. Um, I will move to lay Senate File 1649 over for possible inclusion in the Veterans Omnibus Bill. We have two bills left, um, and if we can, it would be wonderful to get through those before uh, the 3 o'clock hour. Um, uh, next, Senate File 702, Senator Liskey. We are finally here, Senator Liskey. You have been incredibly patient this term. Welcome to the committee. Please introduce yourself for the record and proceed. Thank you, Madam Chair. Madam Chair, uh, Veterans Committee, uh, State and Local Gov. Thank you for having me. I uh, first, can I move the or offer the uh, author's amendment that I do have on file? I did have it handed out. Yeah, members, um, Senator Liskey does have an amendment. This is the bill's first hearing. It is an author's amendment. Uh, is it distributed already to the? Oh, because we're going to get it distributed quickly before we before Perfect. we move it. Uh, can I speak to it while we're handing it out? Yeah, please proceed, uh, and then we will we'll act on it. Okay, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. After talking to. Uh, Multiple people interested in the bill. They uh, offered the idea that uh, governors also interested and in that the recommendation be that we add this to the uh, general fund as opposed to how I had it initially being funded. Um, and so that's what the amendment is to do is to correct where the funding is coming from. Thank you, Senator Liskey. Uh, Mr. Erickson, do you have anything more that you'd like to add in terms of uh, the amendment before us? This is the A2 amendment, Senator. Uh, Jasinski moves the A2 amendment. Uh, Madam Chair, nope, not really. The, the fiscal note for this report, as originally drafted, was uh, taking the money out of the Support Our Troops account. The fiscal note noted that that would put a lot of strain on that account. And so the amendment deletes the section that said it was coming from that account and instead adds a general fund appropriation in the amounts that the department had projected uh, needing revenue to cover the, the uncompensated costs of eligible burials. Thank you. Uh, because this is an author's amendment, I'd just like to move it. All those in favor, please say aye. aye. And those opposed, say no. The amendment is adopted. Uh, Senator Liskey. Thank you, Madam Chair. Madam Chair, now to the original bill, uh, Senate file number 702. The purpose of the bill is that currently, under Minnesota regulations, we are not offering a burial for dependents and spouses of veterans. Um, and this bill would correct that. So. Currently, it's offered at a discounted rate. I believe if you read through the fiscal note, it's at about $893 per, per burial. Uh, in this case, we would waive that fee for all dependent children and also the spouse. Um, so that is what the purpose of this bill is. And I have a wonderful testifier here who can talk a little more clearly to that exact subject. So with that, I will introduce Jack. Welcome to the committee. If you'd like to introduce yourself for the record and proceed. Thank you, Madam Chairman and all committee members. Uh, my name is Jack Schlichting. I live in Cannon Falls. Uh, a year ago, prior to redistricting, I was in Senator D Zach Duckworks area, and actually a neighbor presented this concern to me. I reached out to Senator Duckworth about the issue. I believe it was kind of kicked around a little bit, but no advancement. Redistricting occurred. I'm now in uh, Senator Liskey's district, and a mere 200 yards from Senator Drakowski's district. So I'm right in that uh, kind of that area. Um, a more important introduction though is, is I am a veteran spouse. Kind of unique that a male is in that role, but I am in that role. Uh, my wife had 3,500 hours of flight time, uh, got recruited to, into the Air National Guard. Uh, at the time we were living in Tennessee, she went active, active then transferred back to the Guard, flew C-130s for Tennessee, and then we moved to Alaska and she flew C-130s up there. Uh, 
family came in and, and et cetera, and we moved back to Minnesota or closer to my general home area. And, uh, and so I am a veteran. She was deployed. Um, she, uh, not that she's proud of it, but she did have to shoot off uh, uh, flak because she was in areas where it's needed. So, you know, she did see uh, uh, activity. And my neighbor, who actually has a much longer career in the service, he was a CB, then transferred into um, the Air National Guard here in Minnesota, got deployed twice, uh, did see some pretty heavy activity. And, and he brought this point up, and it was very valid that as a, in a federal veterans cemetery, um, the spouses are buried uh, without a fee and looking at other options. And it was a little shocked that a state like Minnesota that has such a strong reputation of supporting the spouses and understanding that in an active deployment situation, the spouse may not be in the theater, but they do suffer a lot of the trauma. And then we even heard the case of the post risk that spouses go through. So although the spouse isn't the one that we recognize as it, but we still have taken care of them, and yet at the end of life, we've kind of let that slip, and the family kind of gets shocked with a little at a time of mourning of a bill. So it just seems appropriate as a state that when we are so aggressive in caring for our veterans and their spouse, that this is really a simple and a logical thing, and it actually is, when we look at some of the budget items I read about, it's really kind of insignificant in the big picture. So thank you very much for allowing me to speak, and address this issue. Thank you, Mr. Schlichting. Members, do you have questions? Uh, Senator Mitchell. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. So, um, I, and I signed on to this. Um, it, it was when the funding was a little bit different, uh, and, and I think at the time I was told spouses. So we're saying spouses or dependent children, and is there um, any time limit? So, my stepdad's a veteran, and let's say he got remarried for six months. Is it just anyone who you happen to be married to, whether or not they went through that service kind of side by side with you? Um, and you know, in the in the case of children, I mean, that's traumatic for anyone. But in your example, for example, um, you know, flight crew, that means an officer, that means flight pay. So that's someone that's making six figures, for example, um, and probably at least two or 3,000 in retirement. Um, is this for burial anywhere? I mean, I have a few questions, I guess. I'm not being as concise as I could with them, but are there any parameters on this? Senator Liskey. Thank you, Madam Chair. Madam Chair, I believe the parameters are, so for the children specifically, they would have to be dependent children. So once they're out of the house, they're no longer declared as dependent children, that would fall off. Uh, for spouses, it does not have that direct uh, definition in here as far as I can see, um, but I believe that means direct spouse, so I don't know that an ex or things of that nature would necessarily qualify. Does that make sense? Yes. Um, sorry, did I answer the whole question? I know there was a lot going on in that question. So. Senator Mitchell. Yes, I guess so. I just, I get, to me it seems a little bit expansive. Um, as, as I understand the federal burial and the federal plot, and those are specific, you know, cemeteries. Correct. Um, I s sometimes think that expanding everything to a spouse, if it's, I mean, I'll be honest, I have a lot of military friends who are in marriage two or three by the time, and it's not someone that was by their side during service. So that's a little bit of, of my concern with this, is that it should be a benefit for someone that, you know, was really kind of um, in service with their, with their mate. Senator Liskey. Thank you, Madam Chair, Senator Mitchell. Again, I'd be more than happy to talk about that. Uh, this bill is not locked in stone on how it is worded as it is, as we see by accepting the amendment. Um, you know, the discussions that I've had previous, there was enough funding for it previously with how I had it written. Um, we, we had concerns raised, so I changed it to where we are now. Um, I'm more than willing to sit down and chat with you about how to change the wording on that um, before it goes forward, if you, if you would like to do that. Thank you, Senator Liskey. Are there other questions? All right, 
Senator Liskey. Seeing no further questions, I really do appreciate your willingness to work with Senator Mitchell. I'll um, move to lay seven, Senate file 702 as amended over for possible inclusion in the Veterans Omnibus Bill. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. And then finally, Senator Aki in Camp Bliss. This is Senate file 1237. Welcome to the committee. When you're ready, please introduce yourself for the record and proceed on Senate File 1237. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. Um, I have before you today Senate File 1237, which um, I've got an oral amendment, and maybe, uh, Madam Chair, if I could give that to you so as members look at the uh, uh, bill while the testifiers are talking, they'll uh, know what it's about. And the amendment is they removed one line, line 1.12, when it was heard in the other body. And that way, if we did it as an oral amendment, I just heard about it now, then at least the bills would line up 100%. So. Senator, uh, Senator Barr moves uh, the deletion of line 1.12, uh, Council. Madam Chair and members, um, on page one, line nine, delete the colon. Line 10, delete the one. Line 11, delete the semicolon and, and insert a period. And on 1.12, delete that line. Members, uh, do you have any questions about this oral amendment? Seeing no questions, uh, Senator, Senator Barr moves uh, the oral amendment to Senate File 1237. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 And those opposed, say no. And that is adopted. Senator yeah. Rocky. Thank you. Um, Madam Chair and members, Senate File 1237 is for grants to a veterans retreat called Camp Bliss near Walker um, and also near Park Rapids, but it is a little closer to Walker. But anyhow, Camp Bliss is part of Independent Lifestyles Incorporated, a nonprofit organization committed to maximizing independence for veterans. Founded in 1997, they have provided services to thousands of people throughout Minnesota. Retreats are available to veterans, law enforcement, and people with disabilities. And at this time, um, I would like to, uh, I've got a testifier here, but I believe you've got a video queued up with five quick, te or, okay, yep. it's starting right here. Um, if uh, we could play that, it's five quick little testimonies, and then we'll come to our live testimony. And it looks like the video is ready to go. Hi, my name is Pete Rolfson. I served in the United States Air Force from 1963 to 67. I, uh, a veteran, I volunteer at the VA and I talk to a lot of veterans. I come to Camp Bliss with a lot of expectations. I have fun and man, I tell you, these people treat you well. I fish with a lot of guys that never had the opportunity to ever fish before. And it was so fun helping them and watching them. And they appreciated it so much, there was actually tears in their eyes. It was, it's, it's a wonderful thing for these veterans. You know, they've done a lot of things and it, for the cost that it costs to do this, it's amazing how much joy a veteran, the retired veteran that cannot even ever think about going fishing or hunting or anything. And what Camp Bliss does for us is a truly an amazing honor. Thank you, Camp Bliss, and thank you for all of you people that support us. It's a wonderful, wonderful deal. Thank you. Hello, my name is Robbie Jankowski. Uh, I was in the Army from 1987 to 1994. Uh, I had the pleasure of coming to Camp Bliss on a fishing outing. Uh, everything has just been wonderful, from the food to the hospitality and the camaraderie with the vets that I made, and friends probably for a uh, long life. And uh, the things that are done here and across the state for the veterans of North Dakota, or for Minnesota, excuse me, 
uh, are just phenomenal and they need more help uh, but this is a very good program so uh, I would uh, raise money for it if you can uh, money makes everything go around and this is a very well-deserved program I uh, feel honored that I was able to come up here thank you very much and have a good night Rich Lane, uh, Camp Bliss was a blissful stay. I really needed it bad. Um, I was going through some rough times myself, uh, not only through family, uh, loss of family members and everything. This was a vacation well needed. Um, thank you so much for helping other veterans uh, having the opportunity to do this. I uh, had three combat tours, uh, Kosovo, Afghanistan, and just got back from Africa in 2021. Um, I cannot say anything bad about this place. This place is well needed by a lot of vets, not only myself, but other, other ones, as including um, your, your Vietnam vets. I feel more connected with other vets now being here because you make long life friendship with those veterans. And uh, I've made four or five new veteran friends that uh, I will be keeping on my speed dial from here out. Thank you. Hi, my name is Brandon Treadwell. I served in the Minnesota Army National Guard. I've done one combat tour over in Africa. Uh, Camp Bliss, this whole weekend has been absolutely wonderful. It was well needed. Um, since I've been struggling financially and stressful, it got my mind off of everything. I can just relax and feel comfort free of anything. Um, just so much needed time. Connected with so many veterans here. I met probably four or five more that I shared similar experiences with. And overall, it's just a much needed thing for me. Uh, <laughs> Hi, uh, my name is Alan Tate. I'm a uh, medical retired Marine. Uh, I've been out of Marine Corps for quite a while, but it's still incredible to get together with other vets and just the sense of camaraderie we get by getting together and talking about stuff that only vets understand. And then to have people like this, that come and, uh, <laughs> come and help us out and, and go so far above and beyond for us is incredible. So I would, I would, as a taxpayer and voter, heavy, heavy voter, I would really like to see my Minnesota government, federal government, everything, support groups like this and these people especially because what they've done for us this weekend, I cannot say enough about. This is the most incredible thing I've done in a very long time. And uh, you know, just God bless these people for doing this. And I would really like, again, to say I would love you people to uh, support these people and give them what they need because they need it. Thank you. And uh, Madam Chair, if you'd recognize uh, Ms. Ruff next to me, she is the Executive Director, and she'd like to tell you a little bit more about Camp Bliss. Welcome to the committee, Ms. Ruff. Please proceed. Introduce yourself and proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Madam Chair, members. I'm Kara Ruff, Executive Director of Independent Lifestyles in Camp Bliss, and I'm here to urge your support of Senate File 1237, which is a bipartisan bill for our veterans. I'm here today because our veterans in Minnesota are in crisis, truly in crisis, and a community-based, effective, and efficient approach is what's needed. Veterans in Minnesota are not getting the support, resources, or assistance they need to thrive during or after deployment. I urge the Minnesota State Legislature to fund Camp List so that we can continue to provide the wellness and therapeutic experiences that provide lasting changes, have saved marriages, create wellness and resiliency, and provide for the social networks that veterans need to thrive so that crises can be avoided. What hundreds of veterans have told me over the past few years is that they need more community-based services. They need opportunities to express their deepest grief where it will not be added to their service chart. They need confidential opportunities to be vulnerable, to heal, and to bond with other service members with shared experiences. They tell me over and over again how isolated and alone they feel and do not know how to repair the damage that their service has caused. Serious and profound PTSD continues to devastate Minnesota veterans and their families. According to a uh, news site, military.com, when soldiers return home, they think that the worst is off and over. They've come back alive. They're not afraid of dying in combat. However, many are unprepared for civilian life, but somehow expected to manage. At a recent uh, retreat, one of our veterans broke down in tears and was able to show heartfelt 
grief and emotion for the first time in 30 years. And, and his wife told me that it was the breakthrough they had hoped for for the past 30 years. But another veteran present said it best. He said, the military teaches us how to live in the uniform, but we're left on our own with no idea how to cope once the uniform comes off. The reality, however, is much more complicated and alarming. As you heard previous testifiers, um, more veterans committed suicide between 2008 and 17 than the number of US soldiers that died in the entire Vietnam War. Uh, in an accompanying report, the VA said that they are incapable of addressing the issue and it needs help from the private sector to prop properly tackle it, which makes perfect sense. We can't rely on government to do everything. Um, and they said, we cannot do this alone. We call on our community partners to join us in this effort. And Camp Bliss is here to answer that call to action. Since 2015, we've served nearly 500 veterans and their families. At Camp Bliss, the veterans are in charge. We create and facilitate customized retreats based on the feedback we receive and therefore provide a wide variety of services to help our veterans gain the level of support that they deserve. The array of services includes uh, PTSD, Gold Star families, veterans and spouses, military sexual trauma, suicide prevention, caregivers, and much, much more. The wellness retreats for our female veterans have also exploded as the female veteran population is significantly overlooked and underserved. With just $150,000 in funding, we can serve approximately 150 to 170 veterans and their families with these life-changing experiences every year. We conduct pre- and post-evaluations to monitor health and well-being and gather that feedback at every opportunity. We are accountable. We created Camp List with no direct funding for veteran services. We did it because not doing it would be an outrage. It was and is the right thing to do. We urgently ask for Minnesota to invest in what is truly working in our communities, what is cost effective, what prevents exploding medical and mental health costs, and allows our Minnesota veterans to live with dignity, respect, and the support that they desperately need. Thank you for hearing us today, Madam Chair and members. Uh, we respectfully ask for your support in funding House File 1237. Thank you so much for your testimony, Ms. Ruff. Mr. Seifert, welcome to the committee. Madam Chair, I'm not real sure that I have anything else to say other than I work with these folks. And <laughs> it's good to see my former colleagues here trying to do the Lord's work and the devil's workshop at the Capitol. So thank you so much for <laughs> being so patient with us. And this is a wonderful program. And um, if any of you know anyone who has gone through this program, it, it is life-changing and it, it's very needed. We were funded in the last budget, but just uh, with one-time money. So we're back here again. Thank you. Members, are there questions for Senator Aki? Senator Aki, you've got the last word. Oh, thank you, Madam Chair and members. Uh, just, I know that I think the, the path is, uh, as I saw in previous CLA, I'm over for possible inclusion. We appreciate that, and hopefully uh, we can rise to the top and uh, be part of your bill at the end because uh, for a little bit of money, they do wonderful things for our veterans, and uh, uh, that in the end is what it's about, so thank you. Thank you, um, Senator Aki, and uh, to your testifiers for your important work somewhere between Walker and Park Rapids. Um, <laughs> with that, I will move Senate File 1237 as amended, be laid over for possible inclusion in the Veterans Omnibus Bill. Thank you for that. <laughs> Members, we're gonna go into thank recess. You. We're coming back uh, this evening for uh, a hearing on the Hastings Veterans Home. Uh, so I will see you back here at 5.30. Thank you, everybody, for all of your hard work today, and I'll see you in a little while. We're in recess. Mm -hmm.